If your teenage child has been diagnosed with functional neurological disorder, short for FND, and also tic disorder or Tourette syndrome, then do you ever wonder if these two things are connected? As a pediatric psychologist and chronic pain survivor myself, my mission is to empower teens and their parents to resolve persistent physical symptoms such as chronic pain and FND so that they can reclaim their lives and really feel like normal again. And if you're new to the channel, please make sure to grab a free PDF parent guide so that you know how to help your teenage child at home while they're recovering from chronic pain or FND. So today's agenda, I wanna talk about the difference between FND and tick disorder slash Tourette syndrome because these things look very similar, but they're very different. So I hope this will help you and your child sort of be informed of what you're potentially dealing with. And for those who are ever wondering, if your child has either tick disorder or FND or both, don't worry, I got you because I do have a comparison chart that you can take and print out or show it to the doctor when you guys are talking about whether your child has one or the other or both. Okay, so let's get to it. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what tick disorder is because there are three different categories in it, okay? So tick disorders, mainly have three different categories. One is Tourette syndrome, and then the other one is a persistent tick disorder, and then the third one is provisional tick disorder. So I'm gonna go one by one on what they are, okay? So the Tourette syndrome, you basically have to have two or more of motor tics and one or more of vocal tics. So in order for anyone to be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, you have to have both motor and vocal tics at the same time. You don't have to have these things happening at the same time, but you have to have both motor and vocal tics, okay? Be present. And these symptoms must be present for over a year. And then the onset must be before the age 18. So your child has to be 18 years old or younger to have these symptoms starting, okay? And lastly, these symptoms are not caused by um, medical symptoms or medications or any other mental health concerns, all right? So once again, just to recap, for Tourette syndrome, you have to have both motor and vocal tics. These symptoms are lasting over a year and the onset is before age 18 and these symptoms are not caused by other medical concerns medications or mental health concerns, okay? So that's a Tourette syndrome in a nutshell, which is part of a tic disorder. Number two is a persistent tic disorder. Sometimes it's called chronic tic disorder. And unlike Tourette syndrome, I don't wanna say it's a watered down version, but in terms of the categories for tic disorder, you would be having either motor or vocal tics. So you don't have to have two at the same time. And make sure that you're not being diagnosed with Tourette syndrome to begin with, because if you are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, then you can't really have a tic disorder and Tourette syndrome diagnosis at the same time, okay? So it's one or the other. So once again, it's either motor or vocal tic, and same thing with the Tourette syndrome. These symptoms are lasting for over a year. The, the onset is before age 18, and again, these symptoms are not caused by medical or any other mental health conditions. All right, so that is a persistent tic disorder. The third one is called provisional tic disorder. So how is it different from provisional tic disorder and persistent tic disorder? It's a timeline, basically. So provisional tic disorder is essentially the same thing, except how long your child has been having these symptoms are shorter than one year. So let's say your child started having these symptoms six months ago, for example, and it's not quite a one year yet, then the diagnosis would be provisional tic disorder. All right. So again, tic disorder has three different subcategories. Now let's talk about FND for a little bit. Functional neurological disorder is an, a huge umbrella term to basically saying that there is a cross wired problem between your brain and then your body. So basically your body is experiencing one or more symptoms that is impacting your motor movement or senses. However, these symptoms cannot be explained by neurological or medical conditions or mental health conditions. 
So this is where some conventional doctors might say, everything looks great, we can't find anything, so you must be having FND, which is really, really old, outdated way of diagnosing anyone with FND, by the way, but that's really where it's coming from. So you're having some sort of motor or movement or sensational differences. However, there's nothing that you can see on the scan. And functional tick or functional Tourette's are part of FND diagnosis. And that's why I'm talking about FND as a sort of huge umbrella term. And uh, it sounds unfamiliar for many people, FND, because FND was once upon a time called a convergent disorder. Surprisingly, well, it's not really surprising for me, but surprising for a lot of people, FND diagnosis is a, the second most common diagnosis that anyone can be given in a neurology clinic, right next to migraines which by the way, chronic pain slash migraine is also part of a functional neurological disorder, just so you know. But anywho, FND was used to be, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, an exclusion diagnosis. What that means is doctor will go through all kinds of tests like a blood work, um, a CT scan, MRI, and whatever, whatever else that you can imagine under the mother. And if they cannot find anything, then voila, the diagnosis was FND. However, these days, the FND is actually an inclusion criteria. And then there are certain things that doctors can do to make the diagnosis before waiting until everything has been exhausted. Okay. But anyway, so that's the FND in a nutshell. And so how is FND different from this traditional tick disorder? So here is a comparison chart. Okay. Okay. So the number one thing, the tick disorder, a lot of people can actually tell that there is something called premonitory urge, like um, when you're about to sneeze or when you're like wanting to itch your skin or something, you can kind of tell like, it's coming. Just like that, people who have tick disorder can tell that there is urge that they are feeling that they have to do this particular tick, whether it's a motor or vocal, to kind of get the fix. Whereas um, FND, it's very inconsistent. Some people can tell the urge, mostly they can't tell. So it feels to them like this attack is coming sort of randomly out of blue. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, people with tick disorder can also tell when ticks are going to happen. So certain time of the day, a certain place, when they're with certain people, then they can kind of predict that the ticks are about to happen. Whereas FND, it's very, very difficult to predict. Okay. And number three, self-injurious behaviors can happen with people who have tick disorder, but that's very, very rare. Whereas with FND, self-injurious behaviors can happen. I wouldn't necessarily say it happens commonly, but I do hear from many patients who engage in quote unquote self-injurious behaviors like choking behaviors or um, shoving a non-food materials like a, like a Kleenex, you know, tissue paper into their mouth, you know, kind of thing. Those are the one of the complex motor uh, ticks that people have really hard time controlling. Again, people with tick disorder, that's very, very rare. Whereas FND, that can happen. The next one is with tick disorder, typically speaking, symptoms do get better as they get older. So upward of 75% of the teens who have FND kind of sort of get better on their own or have a really better at managing these symptoms. So it's not really um, noticeable for other people. Okay. Whereas with FND, that is absolutely not the case. Symptoms do not get better with age. In fact, it can, um, what we would call it spontaneous recovery and then spontaneous um, recurrence. So they can get better on their own and it can come back with vengeance on their own kind of thing. So the course of the progression is not corresponding with the age with FND. Okay. The next one, with tick disorder, medications can help sometimes. With FND, medications usually do not help with this tick disorder. With FND, the medications usually do not help. And I talked about tick disorder, symptom is lasting uh, over a year, or uh, with the provisional case, it could be less than a year. But usually, 
these symptoms will um, be present for over a long period of time, like years and years and years. And then over time, the symptom sort of kind of progressed, you know, from one tick to the two ticks to three ticks and things like that. But it, it takes really long time to progress to that point. Whereas FND, multiple complex symptoms can happen in a matter of hours or days. So this is the case where you as a parent wouldn't notice anything until one day, bam, your child is having three, four, five, six, seven different motor and vocal tics or combination of these things at the same time. All right. So that's a huge difference too. And in terms of the age onset, usually tic disorder has early age onset. So it could be anywhere between like five and seven and eight years old. That is a typical onset for the age for tic disorder. However, with FND, it's a majority of the time teenagers onset. And I'm not saying that the tic disorder never happens during the uh, teenage onset, but um, it's more rare because a lot of times, I, like I said, the progression is you know, over the course of years and years and years for tic disorder. And uh, kiddos who are having tic disorder, they're very self-conscious and then they almost feel very embarrassed about having these tics. So they'll do anything and everything they can to suppress it as much as possible. Whereas kiddos with FND, there are definitely some people who are self-conscious about what they do and then feeling isolated and in a social setting especially, but that is rather inconsistent with kiddos who have FND. Okay. So that's one, the other thing too. Um, and then the other thing is that people who have tic disorders, the type of tics that you would see are very, very common. So most commonly anything neck and above, that's a very common thing. So what kind of tics are we talking about? So in terms of the motor tics, it could be something like, you know, squinting eyes or um, kind of sniffling movement, you know, or uh, raising eyebrows or um, kind of doing something with the um, mouth and then, um, or kind of like moving the neck and things like that. So these are the common movement a lot of people do engage without or with or without tick disorder. So that's part of the reasons why it's really difficult for parents or other people to kind of notice unless they're looking for it, right? So um, the vocal ticks wise, it can be like, um, hmm, or <clears throat> clearing the, um, the throat, you know, something like that, that a lot of people do and or like clicking, you know, sound, that kind of thing. Whereas people with FND, the presentation of ticks can be very rare on top of these common things. Now let's talk about male to female ratio. With tick disorder, they're predominantly boys or males. Upwards of 75% of the kids who do have tick disorder are boys or males. Whereas FND, according to the research, it's 90 plus percent of the kids who have FND or uh, functional tics are females. So again, very stark difference. That doesn't necessarily mean just because you are a girl or identifying yourself as a girl, doesn't necessarily mean that automatically you have FND or the other way around. It's just a, statistically speaking, they're very different. Now let's talk about comorbidities. So on top of tic disorder, it's very, very common for these kids to have ADHD, OCD, upwards of 30 to 50% of the kids who have tic disorder also have these common diagnoses and also some percentage of anxiety disorder. And then uh, some cases of what is called intermittent explosive disorder. So these are the kids who tend to have like really um, outbursting emotional and behaviors and almost looking sort of like a defiant, um, but it's different um, in terms of the diagnosis. But those are common comorbid diagnosis that you would be seeing with kiddos who have tic disorder. Whereas FND, kiddos who have FND, they tend to have high, high rate of anxiety and or depression. So it's almost always coming with those diagnoses. Okay. So again, those are the difference between tic disorder and FND. Now let's talk about biological stuff, genetic components. Tic disorder, 
high, high, strong family genetic components to it. So if your child has a tick disorder, there is a good chance the, the kiddo siblings or parents or other people, extended family members have either tick disorder or ADHD or OCD or any of these components, very, very strong genetic components to it. Whereas FND, almost non-existent. So your child who has this functional tick might be the only one in the family who has this kind of presentations. Maybe siblings, but less genetic connections for FND. Lastly, but not the least, this is related to how long uh, these kids are having these symptoms. Again, uh, with tick disorder, it's a very slow progression over the course of the years. Whereas with FND, very, very rapid progression. So one day your child would be having, bam, one or two tick components. And then in the next week, you know, your child might be having three or four different uh, and then so on. So it's very, very rapid progressions. So those are a huge, huge comparison chart and then list of what tick disorder can be different from FND. Again, they look similar, very, very similar, but when you really look for it, they're completely different things. So what can you do? What can you do if your child happens to have a functional tics, which is the FND? The treatment wise, number one thing, you have to get the diagnosis correctly because otherwise how these two conditions are treated are not the same. Like I mentioned, tic disorder, medication can be used, FND, not so much. And then tick disorder, there is a very, very strong evidence uh, treatment called Comprehensive Behavior Intervention for Ticks and Tourette's, short for CBIT, that really works for these kiddos who have tick disorder and Tourette's. However, the same treatment does not really work for FND. Some, but not really. Because the FND, the hallmark of the treatment is based on cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. It seems the same, but not the same. So once again, for FND category, you have to be diagnosed correctly by a neurologist and or a specialist. Okay, so that's one thing. And then number two, you and your child absolutely have to understand what FND is and accept the diagnosis as is. Because if you guys are refusing to get this diagnosis as a legit disorder and then continue to um, go into this rabbit hole of getting this hidden diagnosis, then you're only delaying the process of getting treated. Because let me tell you, FND itself is 100% treatable, curable, manageable condition. But if you wait longer and longer and longer, then it becomes a pro prognosis. And on that note, FND is a biopsychosocial phenomenon. It's not just a biological phenomenon. It is not just a psychological phenomenon. It is not just a social phenomenon. They're all connected. And then speaking of biological, again, there might be some genetic component to it for something related to like psychiatric conditions or things like that. But, you know, I want to talk about biological stuff that's pretty fascinating, which is pure neuroscience. When I said earlier, FND used to be an exclusion criteria, and then now it's more like an inclusion criteria. And then here's why. If you're ever having an access to functional MRI, then actually kiddos who have FND shows very different activities in their brain compared to teens who don't have FND. And then here are three fascinating areas. Number one, kiddos who have FND has reduced capacity or ability to turn down or suppress a place in brain called amygdala. And amygdala is literally a fear center. So its job is to basically to experience fear and anxiety, right? And so kiddos who have FND have difficulty turning down the volume of amygdala. So it's really easier for them to be full on panicky or fear or anxious. I'm not saying these kiddos who have FND are anxious person, but um, they have particular difficulty turning down the volume of amygdala. And number two, there is a place between um, a couple areas in the brain called temporal parallel junction. And uh, what they do is they basically have this visual spatial uh, capacity and then the movement combined. 
So for example, if you are writing on a piece of paper, then you kind of know, brain tells you how much pressure to put in. So you don't put too much pressure to puncture the paper or too little pressure so then you're not seeing anything that you're writing, right? So this is where that temporal parallel junction comes into play. Kiddos who have FND, actually this area is under activated, unlike amygdala. So amygdala is, is overactivated, whereas temporal parietal junction is underactivated. And that's why they're having these movement ticks that are hard to control. Okay. And the third one, to me, this is the most fascinating thing. I'm being super nerdy, but that's okay because I want to tell you this information. There is this thing called mirror neuron that everyone has, and they are in some parts of the brain. And what it does is that you are basically looking at somebody as if they're looking their, themselves in the mirror and then unintentionally mimic other people's behaviors. So the perfect example is when you see somebody yawning, even though you don't feel like yawning, you just start yawning, you know, kind of thing. And when the other example is when you see other people running towards something, even though you don't know exactly what they're running towards, you just kind of go with them as well. So that is what the mirror neuron does. And kiddos who have FND actually have very highly activated mirror neurons. And this is part of the reasons why, number one, FND among teens is on the rise, especially since the pandemic. And number two, related to that, there has been this thing called TikTok ticks. So there are some kids who are sort of showing their tick conditions on TikTok, no pun intended. And then other kids are watching the videos of girls and other people who are demonstrating these ticks. And then suddenly these people who are watching start having these symptoms. And that is because this mirror neuron is highly, highly activated in their brains. So when I say biological, I'm not kidding. It is a biological thing. So now back to FND used to be called exclusion diagnosis. And this is exactly the reason why FND is now an inclusion diagnosis. All right. So just to sum it up, the first thing that you have to do is a get the correct diagnosis and understand what FND is, which is a biopsychosocial phenomenon. So related to psychosocial phenomenon, number two treatment is to address any comorbid psychological issues. And I'm not just talking about anxiety and depression, although they're very common. It could be any kinds of coping strategies, self-esteem mindset, the way your teens think, the way your teens feel, and a belief system, all of those things are related and in that psychological category. So you have to address those things as well. Number three, the third step in the treatment is to address any social situation. This is where cultural expectations, school, peer relationships, family dynamics, um, unspoken agreement, because I see a lot of teens who have FND are also very high achieving, high expectation kind of characteristic traits that can be also part of the psychological and then social stuff. So all of these things need to be addressed in order to resolve FND. But when you do these things, then chances are FND is definitely a solvable thing. And I have treated teens with FND for so many times that I have seen firsthand how they got their life back and then feeling like what normal is and parents are in awe. I don't have any magic, but what you see in the result is pretty magical. So as a parent, what can you do? If you can find an FND specialist, that would be golden. In the description and then also in the comment, I will be leaving some of the websites that you can look into find providers in your area. Mind you, there are not that many people out there, despite the FND is on the rise, and I know this is so, so frustrating and it's not really readily available, but you know, there are some resources that you can tap into to find providers who can work with you. So number one, 
okay? Number two, FND is a legit condition. So understanding and accepting the diagnosis is really, really the key because that is the very first thing that you and your teen have to overcome. And however, when you overcome the first obstacle of diagnosis, then guess what? I would say about 50% of the problem is solved, right? Because you're no longer chasing after this rabbit hole of what is it that your child is dealing with, right? So there's that. And if you are a dedicated parent and then your bright and compassionate teen are ready to commit to take actionable solutions, then you might be a good fit for my program. And this is exactly why I created this program to help more teens and their parents who are struggling with FND who are really ready to get back to their normal life and reclaim their health from the inside out. So click the link below and schedule a call today to talk to me directly and see if we are a good fit. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next video.